Why are we so intent on associating the god Odin with Raven, when in fact he is historically also associated with Eagle? Uh, it is as if we're given the choice between Raven and Eagle. The Raven is a scavenger that's so dark that it looks like a hole in the world, and it's sitting on a carcass of dead piglets, uh, you know, behind the farm and pecking out, out the eyes, uh, you know, scary, perhaps even a little bit gross. An eagle, a majestic, soaring and powerful bird that inhabits spectacularly picturesque landscapes and catches of fish by descending from the sky in cinematically aesthetic violence. But when we look at Odin, we totally choose Raven. And this video is about why that is. Why are we so intent on choosing the trickster over the ruler? I'm inspired uh, to do this because uh, some time ago this little face was found on a field in Sealand and I was totally like, yeah, and I went out and wrote, the raven god is looking at us from the earth. And perhaps I was a little bit head over heels with that thing actually because um, I was then admonished by a friend of mine, the uh, scholar Joshua Root, that perhaps I was projecting raven symbolism onto what might in fact be eagle symbolism. Uh, generally, in my communications, I've been sort of trying, straining myself to try to not be carried away and distinguish between when I can only say bird and when perhaps I can say a perhaps corvid-like bird. Um, and, and this kind of precision is important in scholarship and therefore it's also important to me. Um, but of course there are also other ways of dialoguing with symbols that might be more important if your purpose is something else. If, For instance, if it's animist kin making or relation building. Uh, and my way of making distinction between different ways of thinking, different ways of speaking, probably isn't always as clear cut as perhaps it ought to be. Uh, this channel is a space where I'm sharing thoughts and perspectives and ideas and from a very wide array of different modes of thinking actually that ranges from like let us use animism to cure our culture of the stupidity of conspiracy theories by personifying the corona pandemic as a goddess or you know let us renew this ancient symbol onto our contemporary activism by looking at it from an eco-totemic perspective and thereby allow it to speak to us in a way that, you know, dialogues with our age. True stuff that's just an analytical scholarship perspective on something that I'm just throwing on the table or even just an academic paper that I gave somewhere and that I'm just putting online. Uh, and this free-thinking character of this channel uh, is like that for a specific purpose, and that is exploring how to create uh, animist engagement with the world, what we could call contemporary kin making. And this has to have a little bit of the trickster-like, actually, aspect of transgression and playfulness, qualities that, that don't always align with uh, academic description of historic contexts, for instance. Sometimes historically uh, precise descriptions might support animist kin making, but there are also situations where it doesn't. Um, before the time where the animist theory discipline that I carry in my heart of hearts, which is called individuation studies, is, has been widely accepted, uh, our present kind of scholarship is not particularly comfortable talking about Loki. It isn't. But what we can talk about is uh, the probability with which we might ascribe a certain level of validity to specific propositions as to what people, incredibly different from ourselves in very distant, yet tightly defined prehistoric contexts, perhaps thought inside their minds about Loki. Right? And you see the difference. And you also see the, the, how this foundation for thinking actually risks pulling Loki away from doing what Loki is supposed to do. He's re he, he's a piece of mythology. He, his function is to relate reality. It's worlding. And um, uh, scholarship uh, secludes Loki, seals him inside a space, or can seclude him inside a space that is, in a sense, alien to what he's supposed to do. Um, and I actually think that, therefore, you know, people, for instance, creating contemporary queer empowerment with Loki 
in a sense, understand Loki better. And I mean this in a quite literal sense. They understand Loki better than someone writing a piece of scholarship about Loki as a pre-Christian figure. Uh, now, what I'm doing in this channel is to try to create openings in that direction. Uh, because I think that animist theory actually opens that as a possibility. Speaking about Loki in himself, not about distant imaginations of Loki. Um, and... Uh, uh, and, and I'm not also not through being conflicted a little conflicted a little bit about how to align this animist way of thinking with the importance and validity of historical scholarship, because uh, you know perhaps they just can't be aligned, and 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 their worth should be understood exclusively as a function of what they're trying to achieve, understanding beliefs about Loki in distant contexts, for instance, or manifesting Loki today, you know. These are two very different objectives, and they call for very different kinds of production of knowledge. So anyway, thank you for my, uh, to my friend uh, Josh for forcing me into these reflections. Um, and actually, I've spun a whole little reflection about this and uh, that I'm sharing here on trickster and ruler motifs, also in the way that we read symbols of the distant past. Um, the topic here is uh, some stuff that I, that I swept over uh, as my communications on Nordic raven totemism and bird symbolism reaches from Bronze Age and to today, basically. And, um, uh, and the topic is that point in the late Iron Age where myself and others would argue that bird symbolism in Northern Europe starts looking corvid. Right? And hence, some scholars see this as indication, indicating raven symbolism associated with Odin. And this happens inside that era where this helmet was also uh, from the late Iron Age. Because this is the period where uh, we probably start seeing actual raven symbolism. The human face inside a corvid-like bird. Uh, the motif that has been uh, used in the new raven flag. Uh, and as always, of course, there are different views and scholarly debates, and I'll get back to that a little bit. Um, I lead, lean towards the position that sees these pairs of bird fibulae with human faces in them as some sort of, in some sort of cultural connection to the notion of Odin's ravens, named Hugin and Moon in mind and memory, possibly the totemic merging, merging of human and, and totem. Uh, and this is a period that's fairly close to the Viking Age, where we meet these birds. birds. Um, but around this time in history, there is loads of other bird, bird imagery. And both when we look at the, actually the later mythological uh, material in the manuscripts, birds are just really, really important. Agents in Nordic myth, they turn to bird form in order to solve their problems. And this is a remarkably dominating feature. They turn into falcons and eagles and swans and even sparrows. And, and, um, and scholars who look at the iconography uh, from the Iron Age, they, they struggle to define different categories of domestic and predatory bird motifs in the iconography and they go into the shape of the tails and the uh, um, and, and the body and so on. Uh, I, I think that when we look at these Iron Age symbolisms uh, from a scholarship persistent position we should be very cautious uh, when we try to get species specific because humans are like this of course. What you're looking for is often what will seem to represent itself to you, right? You know, it's a little bit like in those famous Rorschach tests. You look at something and then you're like, Doctor, I'm seeing a um, vagina. I'm seeing another vagina. Also a vagina. A vagina. And, but, but, uh, but however, you know, there are probably good reasons to see a lot of the Iron Age birds as raptors because of their sometimes weirdly spiraling beaks, uh, which seem to signal hooked beaks of raptors more than the more straight beaks of, of uh, corvids. There's also something about their bird shape and their claws definitely look more eagle than raven. Uh, but importantly, 
uh, there's also a huge context for eagle symbolism floating around Europe in this period. Uh, the archaeologist uh, Christina Yenbert, she uh, writes that she think that, thinks that the raven reading uh, of these things uh, skips by the archaeological contexts context in a period where material culture in Northern Europe indicates connection with Roman cavalry and markers of aristocracy. Uh, and there are specific motifs of eagle and, and snake and eagle and fish on 6th and 7th century Roman military equipment which was spreading among, among Germanic, specific Germanic peoples in this period. The eagle, uh, in the Roman eagle, is a symbol of rulership and power. The Roman leg legions, they carried the eagle standards symbolizing the imperial eagle of Jupiter. Um, and Germanic peoples uh, probably started using this eagle imagery in uh, what some see as an imitatio imperi, an imitation of imperial power. So North European birch imagery, imagery in the late Iron Age has two possible contexts uh, that we can read them in. The Roman military eagle symbolism of the European context and the raven um, symbolism uh, that we know from medieval texts primarily that reflects the uh, following uh, period, the Viking Age. Uh, and, and in that period, the raven symbolism can definitely also be militant, uh, but it also has other aspects to, to this uh, symbolism. Shamanism, for instance. Just one example is <clears throat> Odin, Odin's birds that are mentioned uh, in one of the earliest lays in the poetic era, the Grimnismal, um, in this function, probably, as a vehicle for his mind. Because notice that Odin seems to be worrying about the return of these birds. And of course this is not Odin worrying about his canaries might be eaten by the neighbor's cat, right? It probably reflects a shamanic worldview where the mind or soul of the shaman traveling in the other world, uh, perhaps in a bird form, is a potentially risky affair. The soul has to return properly to the, to the shaman. Uh, but things are super complicated, of course. Odin is a very complex deity. He's composed by very different kinds of sometimes oppositional motifs. He's a vagabond and a king, a trickster and ruler, madness and wisdom, kingship and transgendering, warriorhood, shamanism, poetry, death, nobility. Uh, and he, he's this very multifaceted deity. He's definitely associated with ravens and definitely also with eagles. Odin has names such as Arnhild, the eagle head, or Arn even. Uh, Grimnismal has an eagle hovering above the door in, in, in Odin's hall. Right? In Snorri's uh, Skullskapa Mall, uh, Odin transforms himself into eagle form. In this case, actually, a sort of shamanic leaning, perhaps, eagle imagery. Uh, this is the story where Odin steals the meat of, of uh, poetry. Uh, and as I think that uh, Josh was implying here, there are good reasons to see this eagle symbolism in the European context. Odin is a ruler deity associated with kingship, nobility, and power. And it makes sense that this eagle symbolism in the context would uh, symbolize these ruler ideologies. Because both before in the Roman period, uh, but also in, in following periods, and in fact throughout Occidental history, eagles have been a symbol of rulership, kingship, ruler ideology. And these are really important aspects of Odin. Right? Now, <clears throat> ravens figure prom prominently in, in sources talking about the uh, Viking Age. They're associated with battles and there are many sources where warriors are metaphorically ravens. Uh, maybe not many sources. There's, there are a couple of sources where warriors are metaphorically ravens. Uh, ravens appear as omens of uh, victorious battles. Uh, there are a number of cases where Raven appears as some, some sort of, of uh, standard. Uh, the Hans Merki is mentioned in specific sagas. Um, I've already spoken at length uh, about Raven symbolisms, uh, but here I'll just emphasize some of the differences between these two birds. And that's not to say that there are also continuities between how they figure, uh, there certainly is, but I think the, the differences are revealing uh, in the ambiguities, uh, or re revealing of the ambiguities of the god Odin. Uh, eagles are predators, they kill what they eat, 
Uh, and this is why they are typical emblems of kingship, uh, rulers, an empire, a little bit like lions, you know. They're distant beings that belong to the sky and the mountains and so on. They're symbols of, of, of power from above. Um, and we should remember that this is Iron Age social power. It rests uh, perhaps not on more violence than today, but on a much more visible and direct violence. Violence is not something that happens when, I don't know, Barack Obama kicks off another little drone assassination program on some conveniently abstract brown people in some distant location in the global south that the few of us bother to locate on a map, right? Violence is, is much more visible. Um, it, we, we today make violence invisible, but uh, in the Iron Age, the violence of, of power was the guerrillas of the local warlord, and they had access. And this is obviously why predatory animals are um, um, evident symbols of rulership. Uh, and, and by the way, dealing with uh, predation and violence are incre incredibly central aspects of animism, a fact that I think many tend to overlook. It is not necessarily kind of a pe just a peace and love worldview that denies violence, but rather a, a, a worldview of respect that faces and tries to deal with the reality of violence. Uh, and I think these uh, predatory aspects are super interesting and uh, this is actually, I think it's something to explore further. Ravens. Uh, ravens feed by scavenging. They eat meat, but they generally don't kill. Uh, and they eat meat that's already dead, meaning that it might actually appear repulsive to, hum to the human eye. Um, it is as if ravens then perhaps come to symbolize death itself, perhaps death in its inevitability, more than killing and being killed with the specific intention of rulership and power behind it, right? They're not distant uh, like eagles, but can stay rather close to human habitations. And they're very intelligent birds. Uh, they can even imitate human speech. These features make raven, ravens trickster-like. And, and this is why you see ravens uh, as this mediator and shamanic embodiments of human, human and perhaps divine mind and so on. We see also raven associated with Valkyries bringing the dead to the other world. Um, and also in, in raven bringing runes to change the wind in a Danish medieval ballad, a mediating trickster function. And these mergings between human and raven, they occur not only in these raven Iron Age fibulae, um, I believe, and in uh, Hugen and Munin, uh, but also in Christian visions of heathen warriors as ravens that transform into doves when they are baptized. In folklore, you also find it witches in raven form, people cursed to live in raven, raven form. And folklore also remember, remembers Corvids as Odin's folklore, uh, Odin's birds, something that I <clears throat> haven't really encountered in the same way in the case of raptors, it might be there. Um, so, so the late Iron Age has eagle symbolism, probably, and it has raven symbolism, probably, but as with anything that has to do with, with scholarship, of course there are different positions and kind of debates about all this thing. For instance, these bird fibulae that I totally read as ravens, uh, there are other positions. Uh, Yenbert, uh, that I mentioned before, uh, she's interested in falconry. So when she looks at Iron Age um, iconography, she sees a lot of falconry. And she sees these as raptors associated with aristocratic falconry, and not with ravens. And she makes a pretty good argument. I think her argument glosses over the very significant sign of the human face making the human bird, this human bird hybridity, which I think is a really important signal. Uh, and I think that my totemic reading convincingly makes sense out of this by seeing it in the context of the circumpolar raven motif and comparing it to raven totemism. Uh, and thereby, I'm placing myself firmly of the team on, uh, on the team of uh, Peter van Jensen from the Danish National Museum, who has, in my view, the strong position that these pairs of fibulae with human faces inside ravens reflect Odin's ravens as human mental faculties, human and moonen, right? <clears throat> Fairly close to each other in time, these two ideas, or the, 
the fibulae and the arteria. And uh, this is a reading that leans on other scholars who see these bird motifs in relation to the shamanic aspects of Odin. So, uh, of course, this is a whole debate. Uh, and but this is also a kind of debate that I think would tend to make us overlook a little one thing. And that is because scholarship tends to look for the unambiguous, the clearly defined, the bottom line, right? But the thing is that imagery can often have many meanings. Signs are really like vessels, actually, and people can put a lot of stuff inside them, even contradictory stuff, a little bit like those Russia patches, right? Though perhaps more elegantly expressed by uh, Gasham Sholem, who's one of the one of the fathers of Kabbalah scholarship, he, he spoke about the sign as pregnant with infinite meaning. Pregnant with infinite meaning. A recent example for the people who stormed the American Congress on January fifth in two thousand twenty one, this symbol meant something, right? But it meant something very different to the people organizing the Biden inauguration just a couple of weeks later. Uh, exact same symbol, exact same context, but very different, even opposed understandings of what it means. Uh, and I think that when you look at old stuff like this crest here, for instance, that probably also means different things for different people in that context. Is this also an eagle? It's not impossible. I mean, we must admit that it's very difficult to be conclusive about species and these very stylized uh, figures. In this case, I lead, lean definitely towards a raven reading for two reasons. One, it was made by a man who claimed kinship line to Ragnar Lothbrok, who was associated with the raven symbolism. And two, it was minted in a context where ravens also had Christians, Christian meanings in Northern England. And I think this Christian heathen ambiguity is part of the point, probably, when Olaf Gudrunsson minted this York Raven Penny. Part of the point is that this bird here can be different things. For some of his subjects, it could signal his ancestry line and his legitimacy as a descendant of Ragnar Lothbrok. For others, it could have been the Raven of St. Oswald, a North English saint that already embodied these mixed heathen Christian signals somehow. Uh, and, and perhaps he was also trying to make it in a way so it would also kind of hint at eagle associations. Who knows? It's totally not impossible. And, but I think that the openness uh, to meaning is something that clever rulers often actively use in this way. It isn't something that just happens to be there. And I suspect that the very stylized character of these birds, uh, perhaps the openness is part of the point of that kind of art, because uh, Iron Age birds are not always open that way. It isn't necessarily always all that difficult to be species specific. Sometimes you just look at something and say, "Well, that's a duck," you know. Uh, but um, but 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 often when you look at Iron Age art, it's a little bit like, "Whoa, they're birds," and they're probably birds. Is it still birds? I don't know. I think so. It's birds. Oh, there are birds all over the place. There are birds sticking birds' heads out of their own necks, biting their own themselves. Uh, and they're turning around and ah, I'm a bird. Uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> so Odin being associated with both ravens and eagles, that is in itself a double meaning. So would it be possible to look at these very stylized and sometimes embellished uh, bird imagery in, in the Vendel period and, and see this kind of ambiguity. I don't know, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, uh, Kulikov and Markovitz actually thinks exactly that. They think that some of the crests on warrior helmets uh, are eagle raven composite images that merges the Viking raven symbolism and the imperial eagle. Um, but I, I would think you know that scholarship does seem to lean towards raptors when it comes to uh, some of these images, definitely. And uh, this is all. This is an aspect that that I have totally not been focusing on in my communications about Raven. So this negligence, I hope, is hereby mended. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about the the openness of symbols because I think it's super interesting and important also. Um, 
uh, also it's also important beyond the context where the sign, the symbol originates. This creativity of interpretation, reinterpretation, innovation, that's actually very trickster-like. And, that, uh, and the, the, these trickster ambiguities of symbols, they mean that like stories and other signs, they disclose different meanings through different ages, as noted by Martin Shaw, this English animist and, and myth teller. A story doesn't say, say the same today as it did 500 years ago. You know? uh, and uh, as you can hear, now I'm shifting my perspective um, away from the intention of the maker in the late Iron Age uh, and towards how we dialogue with symbols today, right? What, what can we say about the uh, Iron Age uh, ideas of Loki and how do we relate Loki today? And in that arena, trickster readings are in fact incredibly important, particularly I think in creating space for culture that has uh, aspects of counterculture. And as, usually, as usual, my favorite example is Afro-Basilian Orisha religion. Now the people who uh, worship Orisha in the Orisha deities in Brazil, they can read this gentle, effeminate young man as this motherfucker, or they can read this vulnerable and victimized person who's been shot as this badass dude who's not shot but a shooting, you know, a shooter. Uh, and they've done this on many, many levels in their culture in order to create space for reality that works on different premises than the modern reality and thereby uphold a reality that has space for animist, uh, animist uh, technologies, basically. They've done this through particularly strong connection and relating the trickster issue. Uh, and uh, uh, the way that I have done research uh, on Candomblé, Orisha religion, rests on approaching these people as teachers not as study objects. So my way of doing scholarship is deeply informed by what I've learned uh, from these uh, people. It's informed by this Afro-descendant trickster knowledge that has emerged um, as strategies for cultural resistance. Um, I would say some of the most effective strategies of uh, cultural resistance that uh, humanity has, has ever produced. Um, so shout out to these teachers of mine Pai Bao Shu, Pai Maikong, Pai Hobson, Mahi Chinya, Mahi Diriya, you know, the good people of the Ilya She, Tafaro De Umiya Ye, you know. Anyway, I, I, I totally think that there are trends in, uh, in, 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 in the culture of re engaging Nordic traditional religion that on deep levels strive towards or follow similar models that you see in Afro-descendant polytheisms. There are these trickster-like, non-normative expressions, Lokians, black metal, Thursatru, you know, changing your body with a lot of tattooing, aspects of carnival, dressing up in these Harry Potter gear, a criticism of civilization, anarchic ideas. There's a lot of playful uh, stuff, playful imitation of ritual that doesn't seem to be actual ritual but sort of playing at ritual through posing for lack of a better word. There's a whole segment of people on Instagram who are like posing all over the place and they're all heathened up with like paint and braids and runes and boobs and cutie cutie and emo dub and all that stuff and I actually think there's a deep meaning to this playful almost invocation of tricks to dy dynamisms, dynamisms of non-normative culture space. And when we today are so drawn by Raven, I'm totally drawn by Raven myself, for instance, I think it is such a logic that underlies. It is a drive towards this non-normative, transgressive space for creating counterculture. This is, in a sense, a trickster voice in us that speaks, a trickster dynamism that's somehow, I think, important. Uh, it's something that we need at this point of, of, of history. And so when we are so drawn to engage some little piece of bronze from the Iron Age, you know, in bird symbolism, as Raven, we want to see Raven, you know. Perhaps there's a deep reason we're looking for Raven, like with Rorschach patches. I mean, I'm, uh, the, the, and the deep reason, 
is that we are living in the raven scene as these British Anthropocene scholars, Patricia and Thomas Thornton are saying, we live in the age of raven, they say. And I'm, I'm inspired by them. I think it's an awesome, uh, awesome perspective. Uh, we live in, in an age where raven's voice want to speak to us. Uh, and uh, as it is also, and this is also why it is manifesting through different contemporary artists and so on. And even a scholar like me who's trying to be a little bit anal, uh, even though I'm not as anal as some other scholars, uh, but uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to be, uh, to be stringent um, about when, when I should call Raven or Corvin and when I should just see, say Bird. I even go out and say, the Raven God is looking at us. You know, when I'm peering into this, well of weird signs and figurations from the distant past. Uh, but I also think that it's important not to sidestep and occlude the more complex pers perspective on the Iron Age bird symbolism. Uh, that this is perhaps eagle, eagle symbolism, you know? And, and I think that we should learn from and acknowledge these uh, different symbolisms. Uh, and, and that's also important, actually, from, uh, from a contemporary uh, perspective. Perhaps the Nordic eagle and raven duality in, in, in the god Odin could be compared to the prophecy of the eagle and the condor from the Ecuadorian shaman and indigenous rights activist called Alberto Tacho. And, you know, he talks about the con or this prophecy talks about the condor a scavenger that lives of the earth without killing and the eagle as uh, a symbol of the dominators and the conquerors but also as the intelligence and technology uh, that defines our age and this prophecy says that in our time the eagle and the condor must fly together and I think there's a some sort of wisdom in this not not only thinking critically against empire and all that, but also from another perspective where uh, the eagle aspect is something that we need. Like, if my uh, Afro-Brazilian teachers have anything to say, then the trickster must be accompany accompanied by controlling forces, else it turns destructive. You know? The trickster, in a sense, uh, needs the ruler. Perhaps it even needs a ruler to be a trickster at all. If there are no distinctions and no norms, well, then there can't be any transgressions and any uh, anti-normativity, right? So, um, so therefore, I really think that it's important that we uh, remember also the eagle symbolism as we call on Raven here in the Age of Raven. Thanks for listening. <laughs>